So if you're in this room, we are going to talk about like the work the Voter Access Project is doing. You are also going to get trained to be one of our election observers. Um, whether or not you actually want to do that, you're going to get trained tonight. So we will, you'll learn exactly what that means, um, and then there will be opportunities um, for you to come get like your observer shirt and your materials um, and to sign up for shifts. But we'll talk all about that all in this training a little bit more. I just wanted to not shock everyone whenever we start going into a training on what it means to be an election observer. Um, but even if you don't want to be an election observer, it'll still be interesting. You'll still get to learn about the role that they play and what they do. But the Voter Access Project at the ACLU of Georgia started back in 2020. Um, one of the main aspects of this project is our LEAD project, which stands for Local Election Advocates and Defenders. I know we have several of our leaders, as we call them, here in the room. Um, these leaders help to monitor our county board of election meetings, um, which happen on a monthly basis. And they just flag for us any, issues, any major issues that come up. So the ACLU has been crucial for fighting voter challenges in this state. And a lot of the voter challenges we would not know about if it wasn't for these volunteers we have at these election board meetings that are hearing about these challenges being submitted and letting us know so that we can rapidly respond. Um, right now, we have about 60 leaders in 22 counties, um, but we're trying to grow that. We also give monthly trainings to our leaders about different aspects of the electoral process. Um, so that they can truly be strong um, local advocates to their communities so that we can you know, stop the spread of misinformation by being well informed. So that is the lead project. Um, if you're interested, you know, come talk to me about it later. Um, some of our current leaders, if you wanna raise your hands, um, you can talk to them about their experience as a leader. Um, but, you know, we really value these volunteers um, and we consider them a huge part of the team and a part of our work. But it's a great way if you care about elect elections, not just during right now when voting is happening, but year round and want to be involved year round, this is how. But we're going to talk today more about our poll observer or election observer program. Um, which we are partnering with the larger election protection coalition in the state to help voters resolve any issues at the polls. And the purpose of this is that these volunteers, they collect the data needed to resolve voter suppression issues in real time and reinforce voting rights protection through long-term advocacy. So the information that our observers are collecting at the polls is immediately going back to our lawyers who can rapidly respond, who can take action as needed, but it's also data that we can kind of can use throughout the year as we are working on legislative strategies and trying to promote good law or fight bad law. We can like use these observations and data that we learn about as you guys are observing the polls. So there's a lot of use that will come from the data that you all collect. Um, You'll be reporting any significant issues to the legal hotline. Um, our attorney will be in the room on election day. Um, and then you'll also be auditing the accessibility of the polling site exterior. Um, I say exterior because we are nonpartisan observers, which means we are only allowed outside of the polling location. We are not allowed inside. That is only partisan poll watchers who are allowed inside. So we'll go a little bit more into the early vote observation training to learn more about what our um, volunteers do. So more on the role of the as a volunteer, like I said, you're outside of the polling location. That means you're allowed within the 150 feet boundary because you are not partisan. You will not be wearing any partisan clothing. You will not be promoting any partisan candidate. So you're allowed within the 150 foot boundary. You're just not allowed within the voting area. Um, you're equipped to direct voters with questions and issues to the voter hotlines and to report any issues. Um, we'll go over kind of the incident checklist and what that looks like in a minute. Um, you'll also be conducting an accessibility audit of the polling place and um, 
you know, you don't report to the poll managers or poll workers, but you do respect them in their guidance. Um, but you don't have to like go check in with them or report to them or anything. Um, just some common terminology that you might hear about as you're at the polls that we want you to be aware of. So absentee ballots and provisional ballots are two types of ballots um, of how people vote that are not using the electronic machines. Absentee ballots is vote by mail. Um, and, but also whenever you vote early, you're technically voting an absentee ballot, which can be confusing because it just means anything that is not on election day. Um, but folks can bring their absentee ballot with them and they can um, basically turn it in, either submit their absentee ballot in person at the polling place or they can like turn it in and say this one's void and then cast a new ballot. So you might see people with their absentee ballots. Provisional is just a paper ballot, and it basically just means either you're in the wrong location or there's something wrong with your registration or there's just some kind of issue being flagged to where they need you to vote by paper ballot instead of, of on the machines. And then you'll have to do a process called curing your ballot where you'll just have to like take proof of residency or your driver's license. So if folks show up and they don't have the proper form of ID, they'll vote provisional. If folks show up and they um, aren't quite, the registration is still pending, they'll vote provisional. Um, ballot marking device, oh sorry, yes. So they have a very complex storage process where it gets sealed, they have, um, what is the word I can't think of right now? They, they basically, all the provisional ballots gets put into a sealed bag at the polling place, and then there is chain of custody paperwork that is filled out. And then that is all taken back to the election office, and on tabulation night, they go through those and they review them. So it takes longer to count the provisional ballots um, because they have to do things like you know, verify that the voter is a registered voter and things like that. But when the voter walks away from having provided that provisional ballot, mm -hmm. are they aware of what is happening to their ballot? Yes, they walk them through the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that usually the poll manager themselves is who handles the provisional ballots and they go through everything with the voter. Yeah. It is possible that someone's bringing their absentee ballot to put in a drop box. Some of the mm -hmm. places do still have drop boxes. Yeah, and we'll be letting you know if you're at a polling place that has a drop box. But yes, they are inside and they can bring theirs. You can also bring a family member's or if you're a caretaker for somebody, you can also submit their absentee ballot for them at the drop box. But you have to show ID is a new law. Except that might have just been revoked with what happened in court today. <laughs> um, but so then, you know, you'll hear people talk about the ballot marking devices, which is the touch screens. That's what you vote on. Formal name is ballot marking device. Everyone calls them like the voting technology or the voting machines. The scanner is what you put your ballot in to officially cast your ballot, and that is how your vote is counted. Um, Early vote locations and polling locations is where you will be at during the early vote period. On election day, they're called precincts. Electioneering is anything that is campaigning that happens within 150 feet of the polling location, and that is not allowed. There's no electioneering allowed. Um, election official is anyone who's working the polls. Um, like I said, you'll have a poll manager who's the person in charge. Everyone under them is a poll worker. Everyone else is a... Um, so yeah, poll worker. There's also poll watchers. These are the partisan party poll watchers. So the Democratic Party and the Republican Party will have individuals there, possibly the Libertarian Party. Um, they'll have a lot fewer, um, but they are allowed inside the voting area. Um, they will have credentials and like a badge and stuff. The only other folks you might see if you live in Fulton County and you observe in Fulton are that there are nonpartisan credentialed volunteers that are just in Fulton County that are through the Carter Center, and you might see them in Fulton County. They're also allowed inside the polling place, or like the voting area. Um, so we're gonna go over the checklist, and this is the main thing that you'll be doing when you're observing.
Um, so we'll start with the early vote observation checklist. Um, if you just want to go along it, through it with me. Um, also, how am I doing on time? I don't know what time it is. Okay. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lisa's doing that. Okay. So you will have this form. You'll be given the link. You'll see the QR code is in the top of the form. Ideally, you will fill this off. off you will fill this in online, but you'll have a paper form just for your own note taking. Or if you have any issues, then you can just send us pictures of the paper form. We'll take whatever we can get. Um, but you will be just. You'll get there. You'll say your your name, the name of your polling location. Um, the time that you arrived, you'll just check, was there a line when you arrived? If so, about how many people? Um, then you'll ask, like, you know, with that 150 feet signage, it should be obvious. If it's not obvious, you can ask a poll worker when they come outside. But typically, you'll, it'll be obvious. There'll be a whole bunch of campaign signs grouped together, and then there'll be none. And it'll be very obvious where that 150 feet mark is. Um, but you just want to make sure there's no campaigning. This even means that a voter cannot come in with a Trump hat on. Like, even voters cannot wear any partisan gear into the polling place. Um, and definitely, like, you'll see candidates will come in and vote, because they can. They just, you know, need to not be wearing any campaign gear when they do so. Um, so that's one of the questions. And then you'll just do some accessibility checks. So was there clearly marked accessible parking spots? Like, were there handicap accessible spots in the parking lot? Doesn't have to be a certain number. There just needs to be at least one or two. And with all of these, it's all yes or no. But if, it's, if you say no, we just want to hear more about that and just like, you know. And sometimes they may not be pre-existing and they might have created some handicap spots just for the polling place with some cones or something, and that's okay. Um, you'll ask, was there a path from the parking space to the entrance of the voting area that was clear and accessible? So was there a ramp? Was there any narrow doorways that a chair couldn't fit through? Those kind of physical obstacles, like, do we feel like it was easily accessible? And again, if no, please explain. Was the, and then often there is sometimes a separate entrance for those with accessibility needs. So we just kind of want to know, like, was the main entrance accessible for everyone or was there a separate entrance? And then we have some questions about like, okay, was that separate entrance clear and easy to find? Would it have been clear to that voter where they needed to go? So that's kind of all our questions about accessibility, because um, that's what we can answer just from outside. Um, and then you're going to ask just a general question of, was anyone pressuring slash intimidating voters in the area outside the polling place? Which in a later slide, we're going to get a little bit to more at what we mean by voter intimidation. Um, was anyone blocking access to the polling place or acting violently? Um, did any voters appear to leave without voting? So did anyone leave without an I voted sticker? And like, you can talk to those people. You can be like, hey, I see you didn't have, don't have a sticker. What, did you have an issue? Were you unable to vote? Like, you're allowed to talk to voters outside the polling place. Um, did any voters report any issues to you? Um, and then we asked on here, did you fill out any incident forms, which we're going to talk about more. Um, and then whenever you leave, you'll just say again, was there a line when you departed? If so, about how many? And what time did you depart? And so you will just fill this out once. Like if you sign up for two shifts, but you're at the same polling place, those two shifts, you'll just do it once period. You won't do it twice per shift, just once for the whole time you're at that polling location. So for the incident form, this is just if any issue occurs. So if one of those issues of violence or intimidation or something occurs and you're like, I need to report out on this and I need them to know about it quicker, you'll fill out an incident form because we'll be constantly checking to see if incident forms have come in. And again, it's name, polling location, the time of incident, please describe it. And then just did you refer anyone to the election protection hotline because of this incident? So that we know that we can flag it for the hotline. And then just anything else we need to know. So those are just like an overview of our checklist. So some common issues of why you might fill out an incident form. A voter is turned away. Anyone who just didn't get to vote, fill out an incident form. Um, if they're, and a reason this could happen is just that they're at the wrong location. 
Um, during early vote, you can vote anywhere in your county. So to be at the wrong location means they must live in DeKalb and they try to vote in Fulton. Um, if there's long lines, um, I would say long lines are more than 30 minutes. 30 minutes is not a long line, but more than 30 minutes is something to report. And if there's any voter Im intimidation, um, which basically is just, if you feel like there's anything happening that makes someone feel like afraid to vote, or like they are, don't feel safe going in and casting their ballot, or somebody's like saying, who are you voting for? Or, you know, for instance, the other day we did hear that some man got out of line to vote and started reading scripture and talking about the different parties. He has every right to do that as long as he's not saying anything about a specific candidate, like that's his freedom of speech. But if he was talking about a specific candidate, then it would become electioneering. But that is something that you can still report to us, because then we can be the ones to assess, was that intimidation or was that him exercising his right to his freedom of speech? So you, that's still something you could report if you saw something like that. Um, is there any police present or law enforcement? There has been a new kind of rule here in Georgia where all the police are actually being going through a mandatory training around election law and election intimidation. We do expect deputies to be at a lot of these polling places. Um, if you just feel like it's an unnerving or like extra police stop by and they just are like, we're stopping by, we want to check things out, anything that just feels like too much police activity, you can report, but just know that we do expect there to be at least one deputy at a polling place. There may not be, but that wouldn't be, um, that would be understandable. Um, and then any confusion about ID requirements um, are something to fill out an incident form. And then again, like I said, improper partisan activities or electioneering. Um, more just if there's any lack of signage, if it's like not all at all obvious where you're supposed to go vote, um, inadequate ADA accessibility. Um, if any voters are turned away at closing time, when a poll closes, as long as you're in line, by the time the poll closes, you can still vote. So if any voters get turned away, even during early vote, that is something to report. If a poll opens late or closes early, um, like I said, if voter casts provisional ballot and you are able to know about it, um, and if there's a helper, so anyone who is not a native English speaker, they can have somebody assist them. Same with somebody who um, is visually or hearing impaired, they could have somebody assist them. If that person assisting them is not allowed to assist them, then that's something to um, report. So just some general do's as a poll observer. You can stay after your shift. If your shift ended, but you're like, I'm really enjoying this, so I wanna stick around, go for it. Um, follow the directions of any election staff. If you, like I have another slide that says, if you feel weird about the directions, call us, but follow the directions. Um, speak, you can speak to voters outside of the polling location, that's allowed. Just can't speak to them inside, because you can't go inside. But you can go inside the building if you need to use the restroom. The restrooms are usually, like, they're not going to be in the voting area, so don't feel like you can't go in the building and use the restroom. You just cannot enter the voting area unless you yourself are voting, which is something you're allowed to do. <laughs> um, so some do nots. Don't vote during your shift, but you can vote before or after at that polling place where you're observing. That's fine. Um, don't report issues to the poll manager or poll worker. Like I said, you don't need to report to them when you arrive or that you're there or anything like that. You don't need to report issues to them. You report them to us and we will report them to the poll managers. Um, don't ask anyone how they voted or suggest who to vote for. And then of course, don't distribute or wear any partisan materials. Don't challenge anyone's eligibility to vote. I feel like that should be obvious with this group, but please don't do that. Um, don't offer any legal advice or establish attorney-client relationships, and don't engage in any confrontation with election workers or volunteers from any other group. We just want to be respectable to everyone. And on that note, there is an expected code of conduct for our observers. Um, by volunteering with us, you're agreeing to remain nonpartisan, so please don't wear any colors or accessories. Just do your best to fully remain nonpartisan, because that could really affect our reputation. 
Um, and please refrain from posting on social media. Um, you can post afterwards. You can post pictures of yourself in your observer shirt outside the polls, but just don't post anything about like what you're seeing or what you're observing at the polls. And then if media approaches you, you'll refer them to me. You can tell them that you're an observer. Um, sorry, that cut off a little bit. But you can tell them you're an observer with the ACLU of Georgia and that you're part of the Election Protection Coalition. Um, just please refrain, again, from telling them anything about what you've observed. Just tell them to talk to us. And don't give them your names because, honestly, that's just to protect yourself and your own privacy. They might ask your names because that's what media does and just tell them, I'm not comfortable giving you my name. I'm just an observer with the ACLU of Georgia. Like, don't give them your names because that could get out there and we don't want you guys having to deal with that. Some general reminders, just remember you're nonpartisan, always respect the poll managers, and you will be connected to your community coordinators, which are just some extra folks we have helping us coordinate volunteers. And the things that you would flag for them immediately is if just if a voter asks you something and you're not 100% of sure of the answer, call your coordinator. If an issue seems particularly concerning to you, call your coordinator. If you just get, like I said, instructions from an election staff that you feel weird about, call your coordinator. Follow them, but then call your coordinator. And then if you feel unsafe and need to leave, like leave if you feel unsafe. We don't want you be, being in a situation where you feel unsafe, but then call your coordinator and let them know, but first get yourself to safety. Um, day of must-haves, you need to wear your shirt, which you'll get from us. Bring lots of water. We'll try to go around giving out water some, but bring lots of water, bring snacks, bring a pen and paper for note taking, fully charged phones. If you have a power bank or car charger, I recommend bringing it. Um, prepare for the weather. I've been telling people to size up with their shirts so that they can layer it over a sweatshirt or something because we want people to be able to see it. We'll be giving you information um, that has the election protection hotline because you want to have that with you. Um, bring out the bring the checklist so that you have them, and if you want to bring a folding chair or something to sit in, you're allowed to do that. Um, this is the contact information, but we'll be giving all of this to you on your pieces of paper. And like I said, you'll be given a community coordinator. There's somebody for the North Georgia, South Georgia, West and East Georgia. So most of you guys are probably going to have the North or West um, region folks as your coordinators. And that is everything. Are there any questions or anything I went through too quickly because we didn't have a lot of time? Stephanie. Question for you. So in my past experience, when someone walks out and they do not have an I voted sticker on, we can query, did you vote? Did you mm -hmm. get to vote? If their response is no, they turned me away, and we solicit why, can we are allowed to give them directions such as, go back in and ask for a provisional or go get your driver's license and come back, polls close in an hour. Yeah. First up, I would always tell them to call the election protection hotline because that's where they're going to get connected to lawyers and people who are directly looking at the code and can give the best information. But I would always, you know, follow up with like, well, did you ask if you could vote provisionally? Because sometimes if it's like, oh, I just I live in DeKalb and I need to go to DeKalb County, then yeah, they, they need to go to DeKalb County. Um, that's a situation where you would it's okay that the voter didn't vote and that they're going to go to their correct place. But any other scenario, they really shouldn't walk out without voting provisionally. So I would ask them to just say, like, did you ask the poll manager if you could vote provisionally? And if they didn't, then encourage them to go back in and do that. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm curious about the 150 feet. 150 feet? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking about my station. By the time you get out, yeah. you're driving the distance. So if we're 150 Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to tell, 
And it's not from the polling location. It's oh, I think, actually it's a good question. I think it's 150 feet from the voting area, not so much the polling location. So like some of the building itself could be part of that 150 feet. But like I said, the poll managers will. It'll be very clear because there will be lots of campaign signs around that polling place, but the poll manager will not allow any of them within the 150 feet. So candidates put them right at that 150 feet line. And so it makes it pretty obvious where the 150 feet line is. Right, and, and for that reason I'm saying in, in my district, for example, interaction is not possible within that 150, right, then that's good. That means there probably won't be any electioneering happening. But there are some polling locations where it's a little bit more doable to have something happen within that 150 feet. And just anyone should know, like, don't come up near the polling location with any kind of campaign information. But sometimes canvassers or people working for a party, they didn't quite understand that or they forget and they come up. It's not your job to tell people that they're not supposed to be there. It's just your job to make an incident form about it. And the poll managers, it's their job to come outside and tell them, but it's not y'all's job, and it's not y'all's job to tell the poll managers about it either. I know you're going to want to, but <laughs> it just fill out an incident form, and we will make sure they know about it to the best of our ability. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, I just gave you paper forms in case you can't. And if you can't fill out the form, but it's like an incident because we want to know about those more quickly, call your coordinator and tell them about it. And they'll make sure that we kind of get it into our spreadsheet and that we know about it. Um, but hopefully you, you shouldn't have any issues accessing the Microsoft form. Like I said, we put it on that QR code on the top of the paper forms, um, and hopefully you can easily fill that out. Can you talk a little bit about once an incident form is submitted, what kind of action can you take to rectify Yeah, it's going to depend on the situation. Um, I'm trying to think of a scenario. So if there is you know, some kind of intimidation happening, what we would do is we would call our count, like, county contacts and we would let them know, like, hey, there's an issue happening at this polling location. Um, we will have kind of those different ties, like within the boiler room, as we call it, and within that hotline. Um, but we'll you know, be contacting the counties and let them know that they need to check out what's happening at this location. Um, things like the voters being turned away and stuff, that's more of like we will just kind of collect that data and we will be kind of reaching out to the voter if we got their information or, you know, we'll just kind of be noting it for ourselves. And if we start to see a steady trend happening at a polling location, then we'll call and be like, hey, we keep hearing that voters are getting turned away for this and this. Like, can you talk to your poll workers? Like, what's going on here? if we're noticing a trend. But if it's just like one voter got turned away for something or had to vote provisional or whatever, then we'll just try to follow up, follow up with that voter to make sure their issue got resolved. So we should collect their name and telephone number so that there can be follow-up. So mostly if they just call the protection hotline themselves, okay. it'll be for the best. But if they don't want to call the protection hotline number, then yes, you can get their information. Which is good. I will add that clarity to the incident form. Thank you. <laughs> right. So that is a further opportunity. So this training was about the polling location, election, like early vote, and the same thing is going to, for election day, nothing's really going to change. But there is separately, we are looking for observers for tabulation centers the night of elections and for certification meetings. Those have separate trainings that are coming up, but you can go ahead and sign up with us today if you're interested in that. But yes, they'll be about starting within an hour of the closing of the polls. They'll be getting all of the results from the precincts back to the main election office where they'll be doing tabulation and getting those results out to the Secretary of State's office. We do want to have observers there monitoring that process. 
Um, more so monitoring other people's behavior in the room because they get very demanding, wanting to know updates on the results. And then the certification meetings, we also want to have people in the room. And But like I said, there'll be another training for that. So we have a target of about 25 counties that we're trying to get to. And this is largely based off of ones where, yes, we are targeting it for a specific reason. We've seen a you know, trend with issues or a lot of voter challenges there or something. Also, it's where we can get volunteers, to be honest. Yeah. But we are asking people if they're willing to travel as well so that we can get some of those other counties covered, like Hall and Floyd, that aren't too far away, but we struggle to recruit in. But we know for certification and stuff, we're going to want people out there. Okay, I think that's it.